One thing is for certain, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Just a few days ago, we had eight confirmed tornadoes touch down in Ohio, one of them not too far from where I live. Buildings were destroyed and people were killed. The difficult part for me was I was in Japan and my wife was here to deal with it by herself. She had lots of lightning, high winds, and long power outages. I have never been so glad to have a backup system that works even when I'm not here. It felt really good to be able to take care of my family from halfway around the world. She had water, lights, TV, security, refrigeration, and even heat if she needed it. Fortunately, we were not in the direct path of a tornado, and the high winds did not damage the solar arrays. But even if the panels had been damaged, she would have still had several days of power available in just the batteries. If this had happened just a couple of years ago, getting power would have been a lot more difficult. If she wanted power, she would have had to go out in the storm and pull the generator out, get it started, and wired up. There was lightning flashing constantly, high winds, driving rain, and that would not have been a realistic activity for me to ask her to do. This home backup system behind me is pumping out over 8 kilowatts right now, and I can not even hear the fans running. That's one of my favorite things about it. It's not just good looking, it's actually quiet. And I really despise noisy inverters, and I have several of them. Blue Eddy sent me their new EP800 off-grid backup system to do some testing with. And today I'm going to show you step by step how to install it. Now because this requires working with dangerously high voltage, I recommend that you get a licensed electrician to do the installation for you. That being said, the basic steps I'll show you for installing the system apply to most home backup systems. And even if you're not installing it yourself, it's good to understand what goes into it and what to watch for if someone else is installing it for you. This system that I will install today will save me money on my electric bill and provide backup power for an emergency for my house. But that's not all. Looking out for my wife and future Dave, I have built a setup that can also charge an EV from emergency backup batteries or directly from solar. Now, when there's a storm that knocks out the grid power and power to fuel stations, I'll be able to charge an EV and get to the grocery store or hospital if I need to using my EV charging system. Welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. Let's get the system built and then we'll push its limits and see what it can really do. This unit requires 300 millimeters of clearance on each side, so I'm going to shift the system to one side of this opening to make room for my sub panel and EV charger. This outlet is a GFCI, and by code I'm required to have access to it, so I'll have to remove it and change the first downstream outlet to a GFCI, since my unit's going to cover this location. Hi, Lily. Lily, you're going to have to... You're blocking, you're, you're blocking the view. Here, come over here. No, like... Since my garage floor is sloped, I'll be using this leveling base to make sure that the first battery is perfectly level. Each battery has two brackets that secure it to the wall. It comes with bolts for concrete, but I'll be securing it to studs with wood screws. If I was in an earthquake prone area, I would probably reinforce the wall with some angle iron just for good measure. From there, the first step's easy. Let's stack them up. Don't recommend trying to do it yourself. There we go. All right, with the first one set on the stand, I can make sure that my brackets are gonna hit the studs where I need them to, and everything's aligned the way I want it to before I stack everything else up. One of the brackets has a stud on it. That gives you your tolerance adjustment to the wall. So I'll temp set a nut on that one. Then there's two mount holes in the cast frame of the battery. I can temp set those two. And go ahead and secure those. And now I can just shoot my screw into the wall. Woo, that was quite the stack. I hate to have to ask my wife to help me with heavy things like that, but I couldn't stack those by myself. This is really a team lift activity. All right, now I can finish attaching them to the wall and get wired up. Connecting these batteries is astonishingly easy. There is a snap-on minus and plus cable for each battery and a ground cable that has to be bolted on on the other side. And finally, a communication cable. So the batteries will be connected one to another using these snap-on cables. Feed it through the handle and then simply push in until you hear it click. They have a weather tight seal on them, a push button to release. It just doesn't get any easier than that. To remove them, simply push the red button and they slide right off. So we'll do the same thing for the positive. Boom. Communication cable. This one is also just remove the cap and it just slides in. To remove it, simply twist the lock and it comes right off. 
That's all that's required to connect all of the batteries together. Then when you get to the top to connect to the inverter, use a slightly different cable. This cable snaps at the bottom and bolts at the top. The torque for the top bolt is six Newton meters. Now I wanna confirm there's no voltage on these before I touch anything. So we'll just double check here. We're showing zero there and zero there. So we'll go ahead and make our connections. Now the torque for this should be set to six Newton meters. I'll use a torque wrench for that. Just getting it snugged up for now. There we go. Now I can go ahead and torque these using my automotive torque wrench to six Newton meters. So then I can put in the final communications cable from the top right of the last battery to the link two port on the inverter and put the caps on the DC cables and the back is ready to go except for our PV connection. Now I just need to connect the communications port. I mounted that up on the wall here for easy access and a good position for Wi-Fi connection. Then I can use a little Velcro strap to just bundle these wires up nice and neat under the communication device. Now I've got four ground cable to connect to make sure that all of these units are bonded together. Just for good measure, I wanna make sure that the system is always grounded, even if there's a change to the rest of the electrical connections. So I'm gonna add a six gauge chassis ground to the last lug in the stack of batteries and take that all the way back to the grounding rod for the house. I used a piece of cardboard on the floor to represent the available space for all of my components and tried a number of different layout options before picking the one that I like the most. I don't like using 90 degree liquid tight fittings, but I don't have a lot of space here to work with. This connection to the inverter is clean and neat, but the fact that the conduit comes through the cover makes it difficult to work with and a lot harder to manage in my tight space. Now that I have the main components roughly positioned, I can estimate the length of wire that I need and then remove them to make these connections to the inverter. All right, I've pulled my six gauge wire through the housing so that I can make up the ends and connect it to the unit. Bluetti requires a minimum of eight gauge wire for these connections. However, I will be connecting 50 amp breakers with large continuous loads like an EV charger. So I'm using all six gauge wire. I've used eight gauge for 40 amp continuous loads before and it gets warm to the touch. Six gauge is a bit harder to work with, but I think it'll be worth it. Bluetti provides these 90 degree connectors for the AC connections because the space for these lugs is too tight for a straight connector. I ordered these 90 degree lugs for the six gauge wire that I'm using. They're a little bit more robust, heavy duty, and I can crimp them with my regular heavy duty wire lug crimpers. You can find these crimpers as well as most other related tools that I use for my solar projects on my website, projectswithdave.com on the tools tab. I'm gonna add a little bit of shrink tube just to limit the exposed contact area for each one of the connections. It is very important that you torque these connections to the proper torque setting. I have seen improperly torqued connections catch on fire before. The torque setting for these lugs is three Newton meters. Today, I'm using this new digital torque screwdriver that Vivor sent me to test. You can set the torque in metric or SAE. It has a max torque value of eight Newton meters or 70.8 inch pounds. It uses an internal load cell to show the actual torque as you tighten a bolt, and it will even record the value if you want it to. You'll see a green light at 85 to 90% of the target value and a beep and red light at 100%. I do miss the click of a mechanical torque wrench, but I really like the advantages that come with the digital solution. Just wiggle them around a little bit. And then I'll check them again. It's only $46 and the mechanical version is only $26. So there's really no excuse for not having one of these to make sure that all of your connections are torqued to the proper value. You can find links to both in the description below or on the tools tab on my website. Now that I have the cover put back on and the wires run through these conduits, I can put all my other devices on the wall and just run the wires through it and I won't have to access this anymore. So let's get those installed. There's a pretty good chance that your wires won't be long enough to reach your sub panel. In that case, we'll just use a junction box. We'll bring the wires from the circuits we wanna transfer into the junction box. Then from the junction box, I can bring them over to the sub panel. For convenience, I'm just gonna use these dinkle din rail connectors on a piece of din rail in my box. That way I can very cleanly bring in circuits on one side and out the other. It'll be really clean and organized and much easier to manage. In the box is a ground lug. It's a metal box, it has to be grounded, but, but I'm using these grounding din rail lugs, which ground to the bracket and through the box. So I can skip that if you wanted to, you could connect to a ground screw into this 
set of lugs, but they're already connected through the rail and into the box and that grounds everything for us. I only have one set of six gauge wires running from my main panel all the way over to the input on the Blue Eddy. I didn't have the right sized knockout in my main panel where I wanted to connect, but using my Vivor hydraulic punch, it was really easy to take an existing small hole and expand it for my three quarter flex. The output of the EP800 will go directly into this small breaker panel from the lower left corner. On the bottom right, I'm bringing in a set of six gauge wires that will be used to run my four ton heat pump. The AC input on the EP800 will go through this AC quick disconnect. So I can quickly and easily disconnect power to the unit if needed. This could then run directly to the 50 amp breaker in my main load center. But for convenience of wiring, I'm running it through the distribution box above and through the junction box above that. I tried to pull all the wires at once, but with the 90 degree bend, it was a lot easier just to do one at a time. I realized I was going to have to put a lot more wires through this conduit than I originally planned. And when I checked the conduit fill calculator, the three quarter was not gonna be enough. So I swapped it out with one inch conduit so that I can run my six gauge and the 12 gauge wires for my other circuits through the same conduit. I made a fairly large bundle of all the 12 gauge wires for the branch circuits and the six gauge feed wire for the input of the EP800. And I pulled most of it through the one inch conduit all at once. The AC input power for the Blue Eddy is a continuous run from the 50 amp breaker through the junction box, through the sub panel, all the way to the disconnect with no breaks. So now I can pull the final length through my short little run to the main panel and down to this double pull 50 amp breaker. Turn off the main breaker feeding your panel. And in most cases, that'll be up here on the top. Mine is outside. And any other breakers that are back feeding from solar, then use a meter to confirm that there is no power in the panel before you get started. I can finally pull my ground wire and two continuous hots and my neutral into the main panel. I'm connecting the ground wire to the main ground bus bar. Then installing the 50 amp AC supply breaker that matches my existing breakers. I'm crimping a Bowman ferrule on these conductors, not because it's required, but because it reduces the likelihood of relaxation in the clamp force as the wires distribute under the screw. Your breaker will tell you the required torque. Since I'm using six gauge wire, mine is 45 inch pounds or 5.1 Newton meters. It's very critical that you meet that torque value Then wiggle the wire around a little bit and tighten it one more time. That will make sure that it's completely secure. You do not want to lose connection. All right, we've got our two hot legs, the black and the red coming into our 50 amp breaker and then the white coming down to the neutral bus and ground comes down and attaches to the ground bus. Now we'll keep the breaker in the off position. I can put the panel back on so that we can finish the rest of the connections. Now I can carry my ground to the box and to the downstream circuits by connecting my ground wire into these ground lugs, which are connected to the chassis through the DIN rail. Now you can see it's connected All of our grounding is bonded through these terminals, through the DIN rail, into the case, everything's good. Now I can use all these 12 gauge wires and put them to these other lugs so that when I'm ready to run my circuits to lights or microwave or whatever it is, all of these are set up. I could just use wire nuts or something to combine these circuits, but this is a nice, neat, organized way to do it. And if I later, if I wanna switch which breaker my circuits are on or which circuits are coming in, it'll be really easy. Just disconnect whatever circuit is into the lugs and put the new one in. I could have used black and white or red and white, but this is what I had on hand. So I'll use the red for hot and I'll put the neutral on the black terminal. There we go, all our circuits are prepped. I have an extra lug in case I wanna do a split phase breaker at some point. And I can always add more or adjust if needed. I'll just go ahead and put some ferrules on these for good measure. Wiring up this box is super easy. You have a ground bus for the ground wires and then two pairs of lugs, one for line one and one for line two. So I'll connect the incoming or hotline to this inside lug where it's protected and then the 
output to the Blue Eddy will be these outside two. So first I can connect the ground. Okay, power in goes to the center lugs. Now you might be wondering why I don't just come out and straight into these lugs. A little bit of a service loop will allow you to connect and disconnect them much easier. If you run it straight into the terminal, any kind of movement, heating and contraction can loosen the lug. Now that everything's wired, I double check to make sure everything, wiggle all the wires, work them one more time. Then I can put my cover back on and that panel is all done. Now to connect it, there's just little bus bars that connect the incoming power to the outgoing power. And you can have this in the off position or the on position, but for now, I'm going to leave this sitting up here just so that it's very obvious that it's not connected. I just need to insert a quick correction here. In reviewing my installation with Blue Eddy, they clarified that this type of manual disconnect does not meet their requirements. They recommend a blade and lever disconnect like this one that I'm using for my solar system disconnect. I don't have time to swap it out for this video, but I'll link to the correct one in the description below. All right, this may look a little intimidating, but it's actually really simple. There's only a couple of circuits we're going to connect here. The first thing I'm going to do is take all of the green ground wires and connect them to the ground bus. I can take the output from the EP800, which is coming out of the bottom corner here, and I'll route it to this generator output breaker on the distributor panel. The neutral will connect to the neutral bus, which runs across the top of the box. And then our red and black for line one and line two simply go to line one and line two on the brake. It doesn't matter which one is line one and which one is line two, it's alternating current. I'm gonna leave my wires a little bit long and put a little service loop in here. So if I need to change something later or move to a different breaker, I'll have room to do that. Then you wanna go back, wiggle the wires around and torque them again. All right, that's all the AC connections for the inverter. We have the AC in through our disconnect and we have the AC out to our breaker. I need to jump in here and mention that there's one more AC connection input that Blue Eddy recommends, and that's a 50 amp grid connection to the other side of this transfer switch. To do that, I would run another set of six gauge wires from an additional 50 amp breaker in my main panel, just like I did for the input on the Blue Eddy, but instead of running it to the Blue Eddy through this disconnect, we would run it directly to this other side of the transfer switch input. That way, if you ever need to bypass the EP800 for service, you'll still be able to power all the circuits in this panel by simply switching this transfer switch over from the Blue Eddy input to the grid input. You just slide this back and forth. The reason I haven't done that for this system is I plan to add an additional generator input that will connect to this grid input on the transfer switch. That way I can power the system from the EP800 or directly from a generator if I want to. But I just wanted to make sure you understood how to correctly connect the transfer switch using grid on one side and blue eddy on the other, even though I'm not setting mine up exactly that way. Now, all we need to do is add all the individual circuits we want to power, and that's these 12 gauge wires that I'm going to run elsewhere, as well as our EV charger. The first load I'm going to add to the panel is a load for my heat pump. I've got six gauge wire. I'm going to be using a 50 amp breaker, and this is a Siemens breaker which this panel can use. It is different than the GE breakers that it comes with. And if you're getting it inspected, the inspector may require you to use the same brand breakers, even though the panel can handle either brand. So that's something to consider. So first I'll just snap the breaker in place. Make sure it's in the off position. I've already connected the ground. So I just need to connect the neutral to the neutral bus. And then I'll connect line one and line two to one of each legs on the 50 amp breaker. And the requirement for the breaker is 5.1 Newtons. So I can set my torque wrench and tighten them up, which is really tight. Whew. All right, there we go. Wiggle them and check it again. 
For the convenience of having emergency power available right here in the garage, I'm going to add a 20 amp GFCI outlet using some half inch flexible conduit and any quality brand GFCI outlet will work. I'm using Leviton for this particular installation and I'll need a 20 amp breaker for the circuit and 12 gauge THHN conductors for the connection as well as a ground wire. I'm just gonna adapt this box over to Flex using a threaded adapter and that makes it super easy to route. I'm using stranded ground wire, so I added a ferrule on the end and I'll add a ferrule on the other end just so that it's a lot easier to make the connections. The torque value is 12 to 14 inch pounds for the outlet. Make sure all the breakers are off. Just install the 20 amp breaker in an open slot. Put it in the off position. Now I can connect the neutral to the neutral bus. Because this is a garage and we're using a GFCI, I can use a standard 20 amp breaker. Then I always put a little bit of a service loop in my conductor and a torque setting for this breaker is 25 inch pounds. There we go. Now we have an outlet to replace the one that I covered up. Now I wanna add some emergency circuits such as my refrigerator and microwave. And that'll be really easy now that I've set up my little junction box with the DIN rail connectors. Also, fortunately, past Dave was looking out for us and left a little extra length of wire leading up to the sub panel here. So I'll be able to remove those circuits and connect them over here without any problem. If you don't have that, you might have to move your junction box a little closer to your panel so that they'll be able to reach. We'll start with just one circuit for reference. We'll use the fridge circuit. Don't forget to shut off power to all of the panels that you'll be working in and check with a meter to make sure the power is out before proceeding with work. Most circuits in the house now require an arc fault breaker like this one, but the fridge does not because you don't wanna have a nuisance trip that ends up spoiling all your food. So we can use a standard 20 amp breaker for the fridge circuit. All right, I ran my circuit through a piece of conduit to put it back into the wall and meet up with our junction box. I'm gonna leave the extra wire in here for now. So first connect the ground to the ground bus and I'll carry the live and neutral using our dinkle din rail lugs. A little bit of service loop in the wire. I labeled my connection points one, two, and three so I can reference them in the sub panel. And my fridge, which is coming into this top circuit, now is identified by below with uh, just a little piece of insulation off of some 12 gauge wire. That's what I usually write them on. So I've got fridge written on there. Now with everything in my junction box completed for now until I want to add future circuits, I can go ahead and close it up. There we go. And that probably needs a label. I'll need to add that later so everyone can understand what it's for. Now let's move into the connection in the sub panel. Since this circuit is for a fridge, I can put a standard 20 amp breaker. It won't need the arc fault type breaker. Connect the neutral to the neutral bus. The ground is already connected through the ground cable that we ran earlier and then the hot go into the breaker and that should be set to 25 inch pounds. There we go. It's my label on there that says fridge. Stay nice and tucked back out of the way. All right, now we can power up the fridge. We have one additional input to put into the EP800 and that's the solar connection. So let's wire that up. Hooking up the solar is really easy. Blue Eddy provides matching MC4 connectors for the solar connections and the tools to tighten them. All you'll need is wire strippers and a crimping tool. When I ran the wires, I labeled them. One string will be green and one string will be blue. These are very simple to make up. They're packaged together with the pin they go with. The male pin goes in the female body. You only need to strip enough wire to just go barely into the unit itself. The easiest way to mount them is to put the crimp lug in the tool first. These are 10 gauge wires, so I'll use the center port. Slide it in, keep the insulation just to the outside of the crimp. You get a nice solid crimp connection. Then you simply take the plug and slide it on until it snaps and then tighten the nut. There we go, super simple, nice, robust, watertight connection. There's the other one. There we go, our plus and minus for our two strings ready to connect. I've used blue and green tape to identify both conductors for each string. And then I added a band of red to identify the positive lead. It's important to also check with the meter before making the connections to confirm it's correct. I did test the reverse polarity protection at 520 volts and there was no damage, but 
I do not recommend doing that. Please check to make sure your connections are all properly made before connecting them to the unit because most units would be damaged by connecting them backwards. Now before making these connections, we need to make all the connections at the distributor box so that we can check the voltage at this end before we connect them to the unit. Before doing any work in the box, I'll turn off all the breakers for the incoming power and confirm that there is no voltage present before making any changes. All right, just a couple millivolts, three volts, all survivable. Now I'm gonna add two more DIN rail lugs so that I can have two more strings attached here, and then I can redistribute the power coming in to these other inputs if I want to. Then I can use these jumpers to join them and turn them into mini bus bars. And you gotta make sure those are in tight. There we go. All right, I'm gonna put some labels on these, make them string six and seven. Okay, my individual labeled strings here, I will use green and put it on string six, and I'll put the blue string on string seven. Just clamp those in using my torque wrench. Now I want to try and test the max solar input for this unit. So now I want to redirect some panels from my main array and that is the advantage of this DIN rail system. I can just disconnect these wires from the breakers and route some new ones over to this section of the DIN rail and then I can power completely different circuits. It's a super convenient way to manage it. In the end though, I'll probably just run about 3000 watts over to it because that will manage my emergency loads without any problem. I don't need to max out the solar input. However, if you're trying to use the maximum amount of solar power with this system possible, you can put a lot of solar panels on it. You just need to find a lot of loads to capture that energy during the peak of the day because the batteries can't make use of that much power in a single day. All right, with everything secured, I can turn on my breakers and check the voltage. All right, the blue string is at 465 volts and the green string is at 428 volts. That's within the range of our system. Now let's check on the blue eddy itself before we plug it in. All right, let's check the green string. My red stripe with my red probe. So I can do this with one hand. All right, we have 427 volts and blue string, 462 volts. All right, so now I know the polarity is correct. The voltage is within range, so I can go ahead and plug it in. Now, before I plug it in, I wanna set the back panel on because I'm gonna plug through the hole. All right, now I can just pop them in. And DC connections are made. Now it's time to load the app and get things powered up for the first time and make sure everything works properly and then we'll try some loads. Now with everything connected, I can turn the DC disconnect switch on, which is turn it clockwise one click. And then I should be able to see the power come up in the app. All right, right away, I can see 1.4 kilowatts coming in, so I know it's working. If I click on the power production icon, for the PV cells. I can see the string one is bringing in 573 watts and it's actually snowing right now. So um, that's pretty good for <laughs> completely cloudy. And it's running at around 400, 390, 400 volts as the MPPT tries to track the maximum power point, the voltage fluctuates a little bit. And then PV two is at 876 watts and 412, 406 as it floats around. So up and running, everything's working. That is awesome. And now we can try some loads and on a sunny day, we'll try the maximum input. So let's get some of that data going. I want to add EV charging to my home backup system so that in an emergency, I can charge my vehicle and get to the grocery store or the hospital if I need to. I did some brief research for some low cost quality chargers that I can use for this system and I came across the Emporia charger as one of the best options. Then I saw they sold a version with current limiting capability using the Emporia View energy monitoring system. For instance, this system will allow me to set the electric vehicle charging current to 40 amps. Then if another load like the water heater or the HVAC system comes on, it'll cut back the charging current being sent to the vehicle to prevent the inverter from being overloaded. This is a fantastic idea I didn't even know existed, so I just had to try it out. I already have a relationship with Emporia because I use their systems to do all the monitoring for my solar inputs and my household loads. So I called them up and asked them if they'd be willing to support this video with their energy management car charging system, and they were happy to do so. So Let's try this thing out. Even though this system comes with a plug, the best solution is to hardwire it directly to a 60 amp breaker. You can get a little bit more power out of it that way and you don't have to worry about any of the issues with plugs. However, I wanna be able to use the plug for other loads and to be able to trial different 
charge controllers. So I'm going to use a plug and that'll give us the opportunity to go over some of the important details about installing a plug. There are some very important things to consider when installing a plug for an EV. You do not want to use a cheap plug that you can find at the big box store. These are not designed to see their max rated load continuously as will be seen when charging an EV. You need an industrial grade NEMA 14-50R version like this one made by Hubble or their generic brand Bryant. These industrial outlets have a completely different style lug with an Allen key to tighten them down to 75 inch pounds. There's a little basket that pulls the wire together up into the lug. This style just uses a Phillips screw screwing down on the wire. A completely different setup and not nearly as robust. You can see all over the internet people who have melted plugs that caught on fire because they were charging their vehicle with cheap plugs. If the cost of your plug is $10 to $15, you have the wrong one. If it's somewhere between $50 and $70, you probably have the right one. I'll link to a couple options in the description below just to make sure that you get the right one. Sometimes the value option works perfectly. This is a case where you want to spend the extra money and avoid a fire. I'll just be using a deep exposed work box to put my outlet in. Then I'll need a matching 50 amp breaker for my breaker panel. I'll be using six gauge THHN wire for the conductors and a 10 gauge ground wire. Because it's only a 50 amp breaker, we can down gauge the ground wire to 10 gauge. The torque for this connection is 75 inch pounds or 8.5 Newton meters. And the max for my new electronic torque screwdriver is 70 inch pounds. So it's slightly above that if I want to make sure it's completely torqued, I can use my automotive torque wrench to get to that level. The EV charger only requires a ground and the two hot legs. However, I may use the plug for other devices later, so I'm going to go ahead and include the neutral to protect future day from having to disassemble the whole thing and add it later. Wiring it's very simple, just connect the ground to the ground plate, which is also the round hole. I'll put the wiring diagram up on the screen here so you can see exactly where each one goes. That is very tight. Then the neutral will be the center, but I'll do that one second. Let me do the line one here. Man, that is really tight. <clears throat> okay. Whew. So this will be line one and line two, which may be all you need. <clears throat> then I'm gonna go ahead and add neutral, just in case I need it at some point. And I'll give them a good wiggle around. Check them one more time. Okay, Whew. now I can mount that in place. One thing's for sure when you use six gauge wire, it's a lot harder to get in the box. <laughs> Remember to turn the breaker off. Holy smokes. Here we go. Depending on your jurisdiction, you may have to put in a GFCI breaker, but my state hasn't adopted the latest national code, so I'm gonna put a standard 50 amp breaker in. Your inspector may require you to put a exposed work cover on your box, but this one's pretty, so that's what I'm gonna use. Once all the screws are aligned and facing the same direction, we're good to go. Connect the monitoring for the Emporia view. I'm just gonna use a separate breaker for now. It could be tied into an existing breaker. I just need a line one, line two, and two neutral connections for this particular setup. Obviously this wire isn't being protected by this breaker. It's way too high of an amperage, but these wires are protected independently in the monitoring device. 
the white and blue in this case will both go to neutral. Normally I'd run this antenna out through the box, but my router is so close, I don't think that's gonna be necessary. Now I just need to put my sensors on. In this case, I wanna sense the power coming into this panel, which is back feeding this breaker. So there's an arrow on the device that points towards the breaker. And I need one on line one and one on line two. I'll put this one right over here. There we go. There we go. Emporia is set up. We have our sensors on our input. We have a fridge. Sub panel in the basement for the heat pump and water heater dump loads. An outlet here in the garage and the breaker for our EV charging system. Now we can cover that on up. All right, I need to add my label for illustrating what's in the panel and we'll be good to go. With everything in operation, now I can go ahead and put the cover panels on. My wife really hates the look of exposed wires, and I have to say this system really cleans up nicely. It would be nice to have a little more space than the corner I've crammed it into, but overall, I'm very happy with the way it turned out. The car charger can provide a massive load, and I really want to see how it performs with this setup. So let's try that first. All right, the moment of truth. Time to do some EV charging. Okay, I'm charging at 10 kilowatts. Let me turn on the PV. There we go, now starting to charge a little bit from the battery, a little bit from the grid, and 4.6 kilowatts from PV. Now I have it set at 10 kilowatts. That's pretty awesome. Pulling exactly 10 kilowatts from our system, six and a half from directly from PV, a little bit from the batteries, and 2.3 kilowatts from the grid. That's a pretty slick setup. If I switch over to the Emporia app, I can see that we are pulling 9,800 watts, really close to 10 kilowatts. Now the question is, what happens if I add additional load? Okay, I kicked on the heat pump. Now I'm gonna start the charger on the car and see if we can push it um, beyond the setting for 40 amp max on the charger and see if the charger will automatically cut back on the charge rate. Okay, I started the car charger. You can see it's kicking up, pulling a little bit from the grid to balance the surge in load slowly working its way up, five, six kilowatts, went over 10, 10.5. Ooh, came back down. Let's see if it's regulating it. Jump over here to the charging app. Hey, look at that. It dropped it down to seven, seven, seven point four kilowatts. That is awesome. So I can be running my heat pump. If the heat pump turns off, then the charge rate will jump back up to 10 kilowatts. And if the water heater or some other device comes on, then it'll reduce the car charging rate. And it's just kind of bouncing around in there to match. That is so cool. Yeah, it's holding it just under 10 kilowatts. We've got 6.4 coming in from solar, has to supplement a little bit from the grid. Now, if I wanna charge off-grid, I can limit it to something below eight kilowatts because the off-grid inverter capacity is only eight kilowatts, which would be no problem with the view or I can set that limit in the car, but if I set it with the view, then it'll automatically regulate if something else kicks on. I don't want to trip the inverter. And maybe I would just set it for the off-grid maximum operation so I didn't have to go change it all the time unless I needed to be able to charge at a much faster rate. So let me kick off the furnace and see if that drops our load and starts the car charging faster. Let's see what happens. Okay, you can see an immediate drop in load, below eight kilowatts. Now the charger should say, hey, there's more power available and kick the car back up. Let's see what happens. There it goes, back up. We can track that in the Emporia app. Yeah, cool. It spiked back up to 10 kilowatts. The inverter managed everything. The Emporia view made sure it didn't overload the inverter. That is a really neat balance of systems. All this technology working together to make sure that I can do all the things I wanna do without overloading anything. And I'm using tremendous amounts of power. I'm running a heat pump, a water heater, charging a car. All of these things are huge loads and I'm able to manage it all no problem with all the load management devices. This has gotta be one of the most fun systems I've put together. And now that I'm pulling 10 kilowatts, I have to borrow a little bit from the grid because 
this system can only do eight kilowatts off grid. So it's, it's not that it couldn't pull all of that from the batteries, it's just that I'm pulling more than eight kilowatts. So it has to supplement some from the grid. If I drop that down below eight kilowatts, then it will stop drawing power from the grid. In fact, let's just check that real quick. Now, if I adjust the car charging rate down to about 28 amps, I'm pulling seven kilowatts there, and that's really closely matching the PV. So it's just drawing a little bit from the battery, nothing from the grid. So I'm almost 100% charging directly from PV. That's pretty neat. I love this home and EV backup configuration, and it works even better than I anticipated but there is a lot more testing to go over. So let me summarize what this system can and cannot do. One of the most impressive things it can do is run my four ton heat pump. You can watch here in the monitoring app as my four ton geothermal heat pump starts up. I was able to run it by adding this active start soft starter. It drops the current from about 200 amps to 30 amps, allowing the EP800 to start it with no problem. I don't have any affiliation with them, but I know that this unit works. So I'll leave a link in the description below if you wanna apply one to your system. Not only can this system start and run my four ton heat pump, but here you can see it heating water with my five kilowatt hot water heater, which actually is pulling over six kilowatts. Now watch as the heat pump starts up with the hot water heater already running. You can see it borrows some capacity from the grid to support the combined load since it's over the 7.7 .7 kilowatt max for the inverter. Now, I can only run one or the other at the same time if I'm running off grid, but it's nice to have the additional headroom, which I've pushed to over 10 kilowatts when the grid is connected. This is a great way to utilize some dump loads during the day by taking advantage of the direct solar power, even when the battery is already completely full. And that can save you money during some of the peak rate times. Let's look at the solar input for a minute. The EP800 has two separate MPPT inputs. One has a 3000 watt max with a voltage range of 150 to 500 volts and a max current of 12.5 amps. I connected a series string of nine standard 375 watt mission solar panels for a total of 3,375 watts. Input two has a max of 6,000 watts with a voltage range of still 150 to 500 volts and a max current for this one of 25 amps. On the second input, the only way to take advantage of the 6,000 watts is to put two strings in parallel to boost the current closer to the 25 amp max. If I were to put 20 panels in series, it would far exceed the max voltage. So for input two, I'm not quite gonna hit the max since I'm only connecting a single series string of 10 bifacial Canadian solar 390 watt panels for a total of 3,900 watts for input two. I've been able to hit at least seven kilowatts on a sunny day, and when you look at the individual panels, you can see string one maxing out at 3,000 watts, and string two still has some headroom, limited only by the size of the array that I've connected it to. Based on that, I assume that if I were to put another 10 panels in parallel with my bifacial panels, I would be able to hit the 6,000 watts with no problem and reach the rated total input of 9,000 watts. That being said, with only 20 kilowatt hours of battery storage, it doesn't make much sense for me to have that much solar coming in. I would fill these batteries up on a sunny day in just a couple of hours. So I think for this setup, in most cases, three to 4,000 watts of solar would be a great match for this storage, unless you plan to run some really large dump loads in the middle of the day, like an electric car, your AC and water heaters to try and consume some of that extra PV that you'd have on bright sunny days when the batteries are already full. I would start with a 3000 watt array, like this one that I just recently installed. That leaves the second MPPT open for future expansion. Looking out for your future self. This system can run all the small and major appliances in my house. And with the peak shaving settings, you can use those major loads to save money, even without solar panels. You can do that by charging the batteries at night when the power is cheap, and then supplying your home loads during the morning and afternoon when the electricity prices are higher. 
For emergency use though, you might only be using a refrigerator or a microwave or a few small appliances and with the nearly 20 kilowatt hour battery capacity, that will last you for several days even without solar input. When running small loads for a long period of time however, you need to take into consideration idle losses. The user manual for the EP800 claims 75 watt standby power draw. This chart shows 50 hours of data that I tracked the idle losses for this system. When I extrapolate that all the way out, this system could sit on standby with no power input for almost 12 days, and that would be 68.1 watts, a little bit better than the 75 watt book value. If I add my fridge to the idle loss and plot that on my chart, you can see that the fridge would last a little over 5 days. You can measure the load for your fridge or any other small appliance you want to calculate the amount of time you can run with by using one of these watt meters. And you can find these watt meters on my website, projectswithdave.com, on the tools tab. For example, using this watt meter, I've confirmed that my fridge uses on average 2,127 watt hours per day. Combine that with the idle loss of 68.1 watt hours times 24 hours would be 1,634 watt hours per day. The combined daily consumption of those two together would be 3,761 watt hours. And then if you divide the full battery capacity of 19,840 watt hours by our daily consumption of 3,761 watt hours, we get 5.27 days. With just three 400 watt panels, I should be able to run my fridge on solar indefinitely. Now, I would need at least four panels to meet the minimum 150 volt threshold to start the MPPT on this system. So I guess a minimum array for this system, if you wanted to use it for just emergency small loads, would be four residential size panels, maybe 400 watt range. Now for some things this system cannot do. Because it's a transformerless inverter, it has difficulty with large induction loads, like the 1.5 horsepower motors you'll find on large compressors, dust collectors, and table saws. I have all of those in my shop, and I tried to run them all with this system. It's able to kick the motor over and start spinning things, but then it goes into overload. So if you need to run large shop tools off-grid, this is not the right system for you. For pretty much everything else, you should be fine. If you have something that wasn't covered in this video, just ask me in the comments below and I'll try and answer it for you. The price for this system ranges from $8,999 with the two battery configuration, which is just under 10 kilowatt hours, to $14,999 for the four battery configuration you see here, which is just under 20 kilowatt hours. However, there are some significant discounts to consider. Let's break down the most expensive one for reference, the EP800 plus four B500 batteries. The EP800 and four B500 batteries comes standard with a 10-year warranty for the $14,999. Then this sub-panel that I've installed here also comes with the system and it's $299. Then Blue Eddy is offering my viewers a 5% discount on this system, which is very significant at $765. So you can subtract that from those line items. Then you'll need an AC disconnect, which is about $60. And I'm just throwing in a budget for wiring and maybe you'll need some support from an electrician. So we'll budget about $1,000 for that. The subtotal would be $15,592, but if you pay taxes, you can get a 30% tax credit, which would reduce it by an additional $4,678. So the final cost after all the rebates would be $10,914. You should be able to install the system anywhere in the US, but you can confirm that with your local inspector before you purchase using the product compliance and certification chart that I have shown here. Click one of these videos if you want to see more options for home solar and battery backup systems. Then go to my website, projectswithdave.com, to take advantage of my free solar calculator to help you determine if solar makes sense for you. Thanks for joining. I hope you learned something useful today, and I'll see you next time.